Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, uh, especially at the University of California, Berkeley, where they do so much great work and have such a wonderful faculty and student body. So it's, uh, it's a, a great pleasure, uh, I mean that, to be at this location. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Northern California chapter of EERI, uh, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, PEER, uh, for hosting this particular talk. And uh, I'd like to thank EERI, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, for having the distinguished lectureship and also for doing all the great work it does. Uh, Jay Berger, who's the executive director, is, is here in the audience. And Jay, you're doing a great job. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation, which has supported quite a bit of important research in the area of earthquake engineering uh, and other aspects of earthquakes, both through the social uh, as well as the geoscience aspects, structural aspects and the like, uh, and uh, who have supported uh, some of the work and some of the trips and some of the data gathering that you'll see uh, in the slides that I'm going to present. So with that, I'd like to say that the topic, the, the, the title for this talk, The New Normal for Natural Disasters, is, is actually borrowed unabashedly from a new normal comment uh, that was made by Ahmet El Arian, who was the chairman of PIMCO, and during the financial crisis of 2008, coined the phrase, the new normal for financial interactions. And I, I'd like to take this term because I believe that the experience that this country went through in 2008 was probably the greatest experiment that we've had in public education of risk. People before that time thought that their investments, that the banking system, that the institutions that they had relied upon uh, were quite stable and that the risks were quite low. And at that period of time, there was a total um, upheaval in the way we thought about things so that it was new normalized. Uh, people had to approach these institutions, these especially perceptions and um, activities to work with risk in an entirely different way. I think we're at that same junction right now with respect to natural disasters. And this talk is an exploration of why I think that way and why I hope people will change their ideas uh, and change their um, frame of mind with respect not only to the risk associated with natural disasters, but also with the consequences of natural disasters on critical infrastructure. So if we take a look at the topics that I'd like to cover, I'm going to look to start with at the Tohoku earthquake and the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Then I'm going to say a few words about hurricanes in New Orleans and New York City. This talk, by the way, when it was first given in Memphis in April of this year, focused on hurricanes in New York City before Hurricane Sandy. So though there's new material. What, what's been interesting about this talk is that I'm being continually normalized as I'm giving it because every time I present it, something else has happened that I have to incorporate within the talk. So I have some, some information from Hurricane Sandy. So slow down, we can't keep up with all the disasters. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I'll say a few words about the, the new normal. So the first topic, the Tohoku earthquake and the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Let's just examine the Tohoku earthquake on the basis of some, some facts. It's the fourth largest earthquake that was ever measured, uh, magnitude nine. It created a 10 to 25 centimeter shift in the Earth's axis. Doesn't sound like much, but I am told that people actually took this into account to some minor extent when they actually launched the latest Explorer in Mars in terms of fine tuning where they wanted it to land. It had a thousand times more power than the 1995 Kobe earthquake. And, and probably as a yardstick of energy, this one always surprises me, 600 million times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. Um, as of October of this year, there were, uh, were about 16,000 deaths attributed to this earthquake, uh, nearly 3,000 people still missing, uh, almost 130,000 buildings totally destroyed, and over a million heavily damaged. Uh, the World Bank affixes the direct costs for this disaster at about $235 billion without considering the Fukushima nuclear disaster. And the price tag for that particular part of the earthquake and, and tsunami sequence uh, has been fixed as high as $620 billion by The Economist, which is uh, 
uh, a magazine that deals with the economics of things, and they had a, a remarkable article on the effects of Fukushima on nuclear power, which was published in March of this year. Uh, this number, by the way, for the nuclear decontamination decommissioning does range through a large range. I've heard anywhere from uh, 250 to 620 billion, but even if we went halfway in between, that's an enormous cost to restate things. Uh, the earthquake, of course, was most significant because of the tsunami. Uh, the tsunami inundated about 560 square kilometers of the coastline of Honshu, eastern side of Japan, in the Tohoku region. Uh, at, at, as it was approaching shore, the tsunami heights were anywhere from 3 to 7.3 meters in height, and of course they were amplified by bathymetry and topography as they came closer to shore. Uh, there was about 50 kilometers of run-up in the Kitakami River, and about two-thirds of the seawalls in eastern Japan were heavily damaged. Uh, this next slide shows some of the inundation in the Sendai Plains, uh, enormous amount of inundation and damage caused by this tsunami. The main consequence, and if we look at how our energy future has been determined by this uh, earthquake and tsunami, has been the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. And what you see in the lower left-hand corner of this slide is an aerial view of the Fukushima plant, uh, focusing on units one through four, the nuclear reactors and, and, and those reactors. Uh, and you see that they have a seawall defense, which was about 5.7 meters. And the tsunami came in uh, on perpendicular to the shore there and uh, went right over those seawall defenses. If we now look in profile view, uh, you'll see that there's about 5.7 meters in terms of design level for the seawalls. The tsunami, as it approached this power plant, was 14 to 15 meters high, so it was well, well higher than the design level of the seawalls. And I think a point that a lot of people miss, it was a direct hit on the building. And so you actually have a recording there of about 46 meter high splash as the tsunami wave uh, hit uh, the turbine buildings of those uh, four nuclear reactors. If you take a look at what kind of a nuclear reactor they were, they were boiling water reactors. Um, about 24 of the 54 nuclear reactors in Japan at the time of the Tohoku earthquake were boiling water reactors. The other 30 or so uh, were uh, pressurized water reactors. And, and the way they create heat and uh, generate steam and then generate electricity uh, is to create nuclear fission uh, in control rods. These control rods are, are packed with uh, uh, uranium dioxide. Uh, it's an enriched uh, uranium dioxide. Uh, typically, when we find uranium in nature, about 0.7% of it is U-235, which is the fissionable part of uranium. Uh, it, these are enhanced to about 3.5%. And then they're placed in fuel rod assemblies. These fuel rods are about 10 millimeters in diameter and about 4 meters long. And, uh, and uh, a nuclear reaction is generated by fissionable byproducts uh, from the uranium dioxide, the U-235 content, and, and heat is created. And that heat, of course, will heat the water in this closed loop, uh, which then is used to create steam. Uh, that steam will turn the turbines, and then that, uh, that uh, steam is condensed uh, with uh, heat exchange with respect to the seawater, uh, and then the water is circulated back for uh, generating heat. If this cycle gets disrupted, then there is no cooling for the fuel rods. And uh, that cycle, therefore, needs a pump and it needs a circulation. It also needs a condenser. So you can circulate water, but if you're not exchanging heat with the seawater, you're still not going to have an appropriate um, interaction and you'll still overheat in your fuel rod assemblies. And two things happened with this earthquake. Uh, first of all, they lost electric power uh, so they didn't have direct power to operate the diesel uh, generators uh, that were going to be uh, providing circulation of the water. And those uh, diesel generators were also located in the lower parts of the nuclear power plants and reactors, so they were completely swamped. But even if those generators had worked, the damage done by the splash associated with the turbine buildings uh, did cause, in, in several instances, a severe damage to the heat exchange at the condensers, uh, and so there would have been trouble uh, actually exchanging heat because of the failure to condense the steam back into water and circulate in that system. Okay, we have a 
I think we're, we're trying to adjust the sound here. Okay. So if we take a little closer look at a boiling water reactor, uh, it's composed of a primary uh, uh, pressure vessel, a, a secondary containment vessel, and then a reactor building, which in, encapsulates uh, the secondary containment vessel. And uh, with the loss of water circulation, the fuel rod assemblies overheated. Uh, when they got to temperatures of around 1,000 to 1,200 degrees centigrade, uh, they melted. Uh, the uh, uranium dioxide is contained in these fuel rods, which are composed of zirconium alloy cladding. And the zirconium melts at about 1,000 to 1,200 degrees centigrade. And as it melts, it produces hydrogen. As it melts, it also drops the nuclear reaction down to the bottom part of the primary uh, pressure reaction vessel. And it burned through the literally 200 millimeter or 8 inch thick plates uh, that were used to, to construct these facilities. And then it burned down into the secondary containment vessel. There, it met with a lot of water. It generated a lot of pressure from the steam that was created and also the other gases, including the hydrogen. Uh, and the operators of the plant had a vent at that point. So they actually released nuclear uh, contamination into the atmosphere. And in at least one instance, it stretched some of the steel bolts that were bolting together parts of that assembly and gases that were contaminated escaped that way. As I mentioned, part of the gas that escaped was hydrogen and that collected within the reactor buildings. And in the four units on the southern side of the plant, that hydrogen ignited and blew up the buildings. So if we look at this nuclear disaster, uh, it started with the loss of electric power to the plant. Uh, it started with actually failure of a steel tower from the earthquakes and uh, it was supplying uh, power to uh, units uh, five and six, which were on the northern side. The tsunami flooded all the diesel generators except one air-cooled diesel generator at a higher elevation near units five and six. And that was a reason why, why those are still operable. A uh, seawater cooling system was destroyed. And I'm just going to illustrate where that seawater cooling system is shown here. So they had no heat exchange and they had no circulation. There was partial meltdowns in units one, two, and three because they were currently active when the tsunami struck. Unit four had just uh, been taken down for maintenance and uh, its uh, fuel rod assemblies were carried into uh, cooling uh, pools. Uh, they were very hot because they had just gone into uh, maintenance. And so with the loss of circulation, there was a real danger of those overheating in the uh, spent fuel pools. Uh, but they were able to get access to those with fire engines and pump lots of water on them to keep those under control. It was initially thought that those may have gone critical and generated some melting of the zirconium alloy and therefore generate some hydrogen. Uh, that blew up unit number four, but it's now generally believed that hydrogen leaking from unit three actually made its way into the reactor building in four and blew that up. So all four um, reactor buildings uh, exploded. There were a number of, of national studies. Uh, probably the most significant or one of the most interesting was the Hatamura panel. This was convened by the government at the time. And uh, reading their report is extraordinary, and I, I recommend uh, at re least reading the executive summary, summary to everybody who's listening to this talk. Uh, they had a number of things happen which are outlined by the Hatamura panel. I'll just illustrate a couple of them. There was loss of off-site emergency uh, center. Uh, they're required in Japan to have a designated emergency response center if there is a problem with the main plant. There was one located about one to two kilometers from the plant. Uh, and when people went to occupy it, it didn't have electricity. It didn't have fuel the, to supply additional mounts in the generator when that ran out for electricity. It didn't have appropriate food supplies. And its air filters were not filtering out the nucleotides that were coming in in the air system. So they had to abandon that uh, emergency center. Uh, there was uh, a emergency response that was set up in the prime minister's building. The prime minister and... Um, and members of the cabinet, as well as high officials at the Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, were trying to make overarching decisions on the fifth floor. They had a number of operational specialists on the basement. 
uh, and there was uh, a, a continual miscommunication between the two uh, with not being able to direct and to delegate authority to the site uh, to be able to take uh, responsibilities to deal with things at the site. And then, of course, they lost electricity, so a lot of the uh, nuclear radiation monitoring equipment wasn't functioning. They had inadequate information in their instances where they evacuated people from low levels of radiation to high levels of radiation. And eventually, uh, they evacuated an area of about 20 uh, kilometers in terms of radius around the site. Uh, it was known that uh, the Sendai Plains had been subjected to at least one major tsunami of, of similar proportions to the one created by the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, there were uh, trenches that were done in the Sendai Plains, uh, and those trenches revealed a layer of sand, which you see in the lower right-hand corner of, of this particular slide. I'll try to get the pointer here. It's a very tiny pointer, and you'll see the, the sand layer right there. And uh, there are organics above and below that, so you can radiocarbon what the age was, and Japan has a rich history a uh, rich set of recordings of, of disasters that can be tied into uh, major uh, periods of rain in, uh, in, in Japan that is ruled by, by various uh, uh, leaders. And uh, this is called the 869 Sanrico for the location or 18, 869 Jogan earthquake for the uh, emperor era. Uh, and they can actually get the date very precisely. And uh, their models show that with the deposition of sand being correlated with the extent of inundation of the tsunami, uh, they, they estimated that the magnitude earthquake for that event was about 8.4. We know now that the sand is deposited well short of where the water actually runs up, and with corrections for the appropriate run-up of the water that have been based now on observations from the water run-up and the sand deposition from the Tohoku earthquake, we know that that magnitude is probably closer to 8.7 or 8.8, or roughly equivalent to what we saw at Tohoku. Uh, with 869 date, we know that's about 1,100 years ago, give or take a few years. And we like to think that when we're designing or dealing with nuclear power plants, that we, we may be designing for a 1 in 10,000 year recurrence interval or larger. And clearly, this was only a 1 in 1,000 years. So that raises some questions, not only uh, with respect to fixing the seismic risk, but also listening and taking into consideration information from people who were presenting it. And, and of course, that wasn't done. Um, what does this mean? Uh, Japan imports 84% of its electricity. Its nuclear reactors supplied about 30% of its electricity uh, when the Tohoku earthquake struck. Uh, Japan had planned, as part of its CO2 reduction strategy, to increase electricity from renewable energy, which nuclear power is, by 2017 to 40 percent. Um, however, as of May 5th of this year, all 54 nuclear reactors were shut down in Japan. Uh, two have been reinstated at the Ohi plant, which is a little bit north of Osaka. Uh, I have in here indicated here one reactor online by the 1st of July 2012, and I think a second one came online at the end of July. So 50 some odd two of the nuclear reactors are down, and the current government has declared that Japan will phase out nuclear power by 2030, and there's due to be a referendum in Japan, and I'll, I'll tell you, the, the people there are not very pleased about nuclear power. The question is, what do they do for 30% of their electricity without nuclear power? And there are geopolitical consequences to this because probably the way that that would have to be made up with is with a much greater investment and uh, involvement in natural gas, liquefied natural gas, which they're typically going to find in fields in Indonesia and other countries. And, of course, China is doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, furthermore, uh, uh, a liquefied natural gas plant isn't what we would call a low-risk structure for seismicity also. So there's, there's some very difficult questions, I think, that Japan is going to have to answer. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's issues with respect to their energy future that are unclear. And, of course, they're the third largest economy in the world, a great trading partner for the United States. We really don't know how this is going to play out. Uh, it, that, if it was only confined to Japan, that would be one thing, but this has actually gone global. Germany, after the, the Fukushima uh, Daiichi disaster, uh, decided to close out its nuclear power 
That supplied 22.4% of its electricity in 2010. Switzerland has decided to terminate its nuclear power, which supplied about 40% of its electricity in 2008. And the Italians had a re referendum to reaffirm their disavowal of nuclear power. So one way or another, everybody in this room has been normalized by the Fukushima disaster because as we move forward, we need to use all energy resources that we can. And I am a believer in nuclear power. I think it can be safe and I think we need it as part of the mix to go forward to decide how we go from current uses of energy to a more renewable and green future. It's, it's at least a transitional phase that's important, but some of those options have been taken away. And I won't have time to talk about some of the consequences in the United States. We are going forward with nuclear power plants in Georgia, the Volkville plant, uh, Watts Bar in, um, in South Carolina. Uh, but the costs have gone up quite substantially. And of course, this is a highly capitalized type of investment. These uncertainties have made nuclear power, even in places where we have high standards and we believe that our, our plants are, are, are well designed and have taken account of risk, make them much more difficult to build because of the additional uncertainties and costs associated with that. Let's talk about New Zealand for a minute. Uh, the Christchurch earthquake secrets, I guess we're going to try to get... Okay. All right. I think what happens is uh, the, the microphone gets under my tie and then it causes some static, so you may have heard some crackling. I apologize for that. Uh, city of Christchurch, second largest city in, in uh, New Zealand at the time of the first earthquake, the Darfield earthquake of September 4th, 2010, about 275,000 people living in, in the Christchurch area. Uh, Christchurch has been subjected to an extraordinary series of events. Um, it suffered the 7.1 magnitude 4th of September 2010 Darfield earthquake, about 30 kilometers with its epicenter. Uh, to the east of Christchurch. It weathered that quite well. New Zealand was really known as the resilient country at that time. Uh, the infrastructure behaved pretty much as designed for. In fact, this was their design earthquake in terms of the levels that they designed their buildings for, uh, the way they looked at how the infrastructure, the lifeline systems and so forth would respond, and nobody died. There wasn't a single uh, fatality uh, associated with that event, which is extraordinary for that larger magnitude earthquake to that, that close to a heavily populated area. Then they went through the 6.2 moment magnitude earthquake of February 22, 2011, and that destroyed Christchurch. I lived in Christchurch in 1999. It was called the Garden City of New Zealand. I like to look at it as the Garden City of the world. It was extraordinary shock to see the entire central business district destroyed. And to this day, it remains wounded and will never come back in the form that it used to be. There was another earthquake in June 13th, 2011. And these, these earthquakes are the largest. They were generally a, a accompanied by another earthquake of smaller magnitude on, on these dates. And then finally, uh, one on the 23rd of December, 2011. Uh, so extraordinary series of events, uh, successive earthquakes, uh, disrupting the infrastructure and, and causing pain in, in their own regard. Uh, about 190 deaths. The central business district, as I said, totally destroyed. Uh, there's going to be about 11, excuse me, about 1,800 CBD buildings, which will eventually be demolished. I think that number is around 1,500 right now. About 55,000 residences in the, in the suburbs surrounding the central business district, which have been heavily damaged. Uh, and the damage we know now is uh, fixed at around $30 billion. And if you normalize that with respect to the gross domestic product of, of New Zealand, it's over 20%. This is an extraordinary ratio because we've never seen that in a developed country before. Uh, imagine taking 20 to 25 percent of your forward economic productivity and have to uh, deal with one disaster associated with it. And then, of course, this particular series of earthquakes caused massive liquefaction and infrastructure damage every time there was one of those major earthquakes. The strong ground motions were, were also extraordinary. For a 6.2 or 6 magnitude earthquakes, they were at levels that were unanticipated. I'm going to show you some response spectra associated with central business district uh, recordings at CHHC and CCCC. These are the Christchurch Hospital and the Christchurch College. And then we'll look at the Heathcote Valley Strong Motion Station, which is a little bit closer in the Port Hills uh, to the epicenter for the 22nd February 2011 Christchurch earthquake. 
Uh, if we look, and we have to be careful, these are, are, are drawn in um, log scales. And so you see the black line there, which was the design spectra. They designed for about a 475 return inter year return interval for ordinary structures. Uh, the red is Darfield, and you can see that's kind of matching the design earthquake. And then the blue is the Christchurch earthquake. And remember, this is a log scale. So in the period range or the frequency range, which we're most concerned about for many of our structures, uh, those accelerations, those spectral accelerations, are 60, 70 percent higher than what the design was. The GNS, uh, New Zealand's equivalent to the USGS, uh, fixes the return interval of that kind of motion at about 5,000 years. Imagine that for a six magnitude earthquake. This is, I mean, we know this happens now, but prior to that, nobody was saying that something like that could happen with that great an extension. Uh, if we look at the Heathcote Valley, there's both vertical and horizontal. Let's stay with the solid blue and solid red lines. Both the Darfield and the Christchurch earthquake are much higher than the design spectra here. And if we focus on the blue, the horizontal spectral accelerations, they are 100% or more higher than design. Uh, GNS says that's a 1 in 10,000 year return interval. And we know at the Heathcote Valley Station that we were measuring uh, accelerations at 1.2 g and vertical accelerations at 2.2 g. So extraordinary levels of ground motion for what are relatively small magnitude earthquakes. And of course, that's accompanied by massive liquefaction. So if we look at the, uh, our interpretation of, uh, of serious liquefaction through GIS, um, for the Darfield earthquake, the 4th September 2010, about 52 square kilometers or approximately 35% of the built up area of Christchurch, massive liquefaction. 96 square kilometers for the Christchurch earthquake of February 22nd or about 65% of the built up area. We define that by the way as the extent of their water distribution system. And so we can get the area of the water distribution system and map on top of that what the observed liquefaction severities are and, uh, and get a ratio or get a, uh, an area and, and then a ratio relative to the built up area. And then the June 13th, uh, 2011, about 91 square kilometers uh, or about 61% of the built up area. If we take a look at Bexley, which is in the eastern suburbs of Christchurch, just to get an aerial view of how things looked, you can see Bexley, you can see in the background there's dust rising from the collapse of buildings. And uh, Beckley's road system looks like a canal system because of the massive liquefaction and the water that came up, but more so by the many pipelines which were ruptured, causing additional water to flow, and artesian wells, which were also located in an area, and they also paid a lot of water out. Uh, some of this water had erosional powers and created sinkholes that cars fell into, as you can see. Uh, and the whole area of Bexley, since the beginning of the Canterbury earthquake sequence has subsided about 1.2, 1.5 meters, which means it's now not only at risk with respect to liquefaction in a future earthquake, but is now at risk from flooding of the Avon River, which you see in the foreground there, and has been abandoned. It's been declared a red zone. Uh, this is a, a fairly extraordinary measure. Uh, this area, along with many others uh, along the Avon River, uh, have been um, literally abandoned. People have been moved out, or at least they're not going to be provided with insurance coverage, and they're not going to be provided with utilities, which doesn't give them much option for staying. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an extraordinary consequence socially of these events. Wastewater system. I never really thought as much about it until I visited Christchurch many times. Christchurch has one plant. It's the Bromley plant. And so it's alimentary, my dear Watson, that this plant has to function properly. And uh, there's a connectivity between the pipeline damage and the plant, and that is every time the pipelines get damaged, uh, sediment and soil comes into the pipelines. And in addition to having the damaged pipelines, you have the sediment being washed down into the plant. Here's some pictures of some of the broken concrete lines, which, which typically were fractured at their joints because of differential movement and pullout. And here's the, uh, the treatment plant at Bromley. You can see the lagoons, by the way, the lagoons suffered liquefaction in their levees, and so the flow in those lagoons and the piping between those levee systems and the different units of lagoons have been totally um, uh, rearranged, and they're not functioning as well or as intended for tertiary treatment. But all of that grit and um, 
sediment comes into the primary settlement tanks. They have scrapers which are then destroyed by trying to scrape off the sediment that comes in. Uh, and then you get solids into the secondary treatment system, which affects the chemistry and the biology there, which then has to be uh, modified with additional chemical and biological alterations. And then the clarifiers, which are essential for the secondary uh, treatment system, settled differentially because of soil liquefaction. So they really had a crisis. And fixing this is not easy. Fixing the pipeline system, you know, when you fix a water supply, those pipelines are down about two feet to three feet, about a meter in depth. Uh, so in Christchurch, most of those are above the water table. It's not hard to get them repaired. If there's a lot of them, it's a problem, of course, but each individual one is not particularly hard. But a wastewater system, that's a gravity system primarily. There's, there are parts where it's surcharged or they have to pump over elevations. But um, there, they're down in order to keep the gravity grade of flow on the order of three to five meters in depth. Now, you've got a water table at one meter below ground surface, if you're going to dig a trench which is three to four meters, you've got to put steel sheet pile in there, you've got to put supports in there, you've got to use well points to dewater it. It gets very expensive. Every meter of pipeline starts costing one to two thousand dollars. And uh, the expense of just the multiple repairs on these pipelines uh, actually emptied one of their insurance uh, uh, coverages. It's called the Local Authority Protection Plan. And that was a joint uh, insurance coverage. Uh, we had full reinsurance. Uh, and uh, by the time they got to the Christchurch earthquake and started repairing the Christchurch system, they had already done the repairs for the Darfield, um, they had bankrupted that particular account. We like to, to say that ductile pipelines are an important part of resilience. At Cornell, with our uh, Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation NEES facility, uh, we've looked at the behavior of ductile pipelines. Uh, when visiting New Zealand with a GEAR group and a Teakley group after the Darfield earthquake, uh, the Christchurch uh, City Council people asked us how would we replace some of the segmental pipelines in their water supply. These were segmental cast iron and asbestos cement primarily. Um, and we said the best pipelines would be something like a high-density polyethylene or a medium-density polyethylene. And they, it's very difficult for a company that, that's in the business of putting in segmental pipelines to switch to a continuous pipeline, which then requires thermal welding and a variety of, uh, of infrastructure that they don't, and training that they don't necessarily have. But they thought about it, and they put in uh, about two and a half kilometers, which are shown in yellow here in the area of Burwood, uh, the Horseshoe Lake area, an area of intense liquefaction repeatedly occurring. Uh, in, in the four major earthquakes that I showed and even some minor liquefaction in some of the aftershocks. Uh, and those two and a half kilometers of high density pipeline that were in place for the Christchurch, the June 13th, 2011 and December 23rd, 2011 earthquakes underwent about two meters of lateral movement at this location and not a single damage in any of them, whereas all the pipelines surrounding them were seriously impaired and damaged. And uh, if we didn't believe in the resilience of ductile pipelines, we can compare the performance of the water distribution system, which you see in the bottom portion of this picture, where all of the locations of repair in GIS are superimposed on red, which are the liquefiable areas of intense liquefaction. There's about 1,700 repairs for about 1,700 kilometers of pipeline. That's an enormous repair rate, I can assure you. Uh, and we have a system that we can compare it with. That's the gas distribution system. That's about 170 kilometers, so it's one-tenth the size, but it's in the red zone. It's in the, the red zone, at least for this slide, of areas of, of, of significant liquefaction. And for four earthquakes, not one single repair. In fact, the only repair that we could document from all of those earthquakes was one service line which squeezed shut because a concrete block closed it off. So um, resilience starts with having strong systems and Christchurch is rebuilding their entire system. The, work, the repaired pipelines will be put back as high density and medium density polyethylene and quite a bit of it's going to get into the wastewater treatment system. They desperately need to import this lesson, lesson to Wellington. New, Ze New Zealand insurance. New Zealand by and large is, is a, was a very heavily well covered country in terms of, of insurance and about 80% insurance coverage before the earthquakes. After the earthquakes, uh, in fact, after the Christchurch earthquake, there was a serious renegotiation of, of insurance because the uh, 
reinsurance industry became pretty unhappy about investing in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, and uh, these negotiations went on for a year when I won't say that, that New Zealand was, was uninsurable. It's just that the prices that they wanted them to pay were, were not particularly acceptable. And they have reached a, an agreement in terms of, of insurance coverage for the future. Uh, to, to cover this, there's been, a, at least in the short term here, there's been a fourfold increase in insurance rates, but that, those actually may go up. Uh, there's, there's been a cap on what's going to be insured. And then, of course, uh, we see the termination of the local authorities' protection program as, as a consequence of repairing some of this repeated damage, especially, interestingly enough, with the wastewater repair system, which ends up being a very expensive system to reinstate, a, a good lesson for all of us. So that is the Tohoku and the Canterbury earthquakes, enough to put us into a new perspective. I, I, I'd say after these events, we really do need to start to think of things differently. Uh, just to imagine that much damage from six magnitude earthquakes is, is, is chilling in its own respect. It, it, it kind of tells us that you don't have to be part of a big event. You can be uh, in a participant in a small event. You just need to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we don't really know what that is ahead of time. If, if Tohoku was a sledgehammer, then, then the Canterbury earthquake sequence was a hypodermic needle where edge basin effects, uh, site amplification, forward directivity, a variety of, of, of influences converged uh, to create a substantial amount of, in, of, of energy where, where most of the people lived. Well, we have hurricanes, and I'm going to talk briefly about hurricanes in New Orleans and, and hurricanes in New York City. Maybe not as briefly as I intended to for New York City because probably people like to hear something about Hurricane Sandy. But you can't talk about New Orleans unless you talk about the Mississippi Deltaic Plain because the, the, the connectivity between New Orleans and the environment, the, the geo-environment in which it's built, uh, is so strong that the solution for one is the solution for the other. So it's, it's a work in progress. It's a, it's a very large problem that requires the management uh, in one way or another of about 25,000 square kilometers of delta, uh, which, which is at an uneasy equilibrium with the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Unless there's sediment that's replenished, the dynamic boundary between erosion from the Gulf and the land that's stable from sedimentation uh, begins to recede and New Orleans and other built-up areas of the Deltaic Plain become increasingly subjected to risk. And as you can see by the most recent delta, the famous bird's foot, we are canalizing all that sediment in the main course of the Mississippi and putting it exactly where it should be in the abysmal plain of the Gulf of Mexico. So if we take a closer look at New Orleans, which we're showing down at the lower right-hand portion of this slide, the Mississippi runs east-west at New Orleans, so if we now identify New Orleans and make it wiggle. It's between a rock and a hard place. Uh, the rock is Lake Pontchartrain on the north, which is the hard place, or the rock, and the, and the river is the, is the other part of it on the south. And if we show a cross section through New Orleans, which is a little exaggerated, but makes the point, I call this the Super Bowl of sustainability. Anybody living in New Orleans at any given time is between three two to four meters below one of the water levels, either the river or the sea. And of course, during storm tide times at either one of those, it, it becomes even worse. New Orleans, of course, is actively subsiding. Uh, so in, in a way, it's a wasting asset. It's uh, getting worse every year. And of course, if you build a levee, that immediately begins to sink in the ground because it's normally consolidated, in some cases, under consolidated sediments underneath it. And you begin to pick up significant amounts of movement the minute that the levee is put into place. So New Orleans occupies a footprint which is questionable with respect to sustainability. And if there's a place that is an experiment between the social, technical, and environmental forces, it's certainly New Orleans. How, how New Orleans works to deal with this problem probably speaks great volumes for the rest of us because it is a, a very complex issue and problem down there. Hurricane Katrina, of course, was the greatest U.S. disaster. It's got competition, though, lately. 2,000 dead and missing, over $120 billion of losses just in New Orleans. 80% of New Orleans was flooded. It took 53 days to dewater. And that doesn't even address some of the extraordinary stories and impacts on our 
energy infrastructure in the Gulf and also energy pipeline systems which were impacted by this event um, as a consequence of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we know that there was a complete failure of the hurricane protection system and I'm not going to go into the details here in, in the interest of time. But Hurricane Katrina did something which was quite significant. As you remember, 2001 or 2000 to 2010 was a year that we had to go through at least two major extreme events, starting with September 11th. And the mantra that was picked up by the Department of Homeland Security after September 11th was the protection of critical infrastructure. And of course, once we got to Hurricane Katrina, that's exactly what we were doing in New Orleans. We were protecting the critical infrastructure with the government through the Corps of Engineers, uh, putting in a system that didn't work. And the system didn't work not because of the Corps of, en of Engineers. It, it, it didn't work because of the relationship between the communities, the Corps, the way we understood risk, the way we quantified it, the way we approached it, and the way we thought holistically and integratively about the particular problem that we had. And at that point, the Department of Homeland Security took up the mantra of resilient communities because the solution was perceived at that stage to be where it really does need to be, and that is with the people that have to live and subject themselves to or be subjected to and contend with these extreme events. However, the use of resilience was fuzzy. I think it still is in many instances, and it's still a subject of debate academically and certainly with respect of implementation. It may be that we never define resilience, but at least the concept makes sense, making communities and infrastructure stronger and more able to respond to shocks. Now, let's just consider three factors with respect to New Orleans and what Hurricane Katrina taught us. It taught us that we shouldn't take our eye off the Mississippi to start with. Although hurricanes are maybe the disaster du jour, you still have a significant threat of flooding along the Mississippi. And in fact, you may even lose the Mississippi because geologically now the Atchafalaya would like to take the Mississippi down an entirely different pathway, by the way, which is necessary geologically to replenish a 25,000 square kilometer delta. If the Mississippi didn't change by a, a 50 or 100 kilometers every so often in geologic time, about every thousand years, which it does, and it, it doesn't now because we've constrained it not to, you wouldn't have such a big deltaic plain. In any case, the Mississippi drains about 41% of the U.S. and it goes right by New Orleans and part of it goes down now the Atchafalaya. Uh, at the peak storms or floods of the 20th century, 27, 37, 73, the gauging station north of New Orleans measured 65 kilotons a second. That is a billion gallons of water a minute. That's the entire water supply of New York a day every minute. So water is a big issue, but water carries a lot of sediment. The Mississippi carries about 200 million metric tons of sediment a year. And if you were to spread that over about 100 square kilometers, depending upon how you argue the void ratio, you get between one and two meters. So if you cut that off or canalize it or keep it out of the distributaries, it can't do its restorative work, which is precisely what's going on. So if it wasn't just the Mississippi, and the Mississippi is not just a water event, it's a sediment event, then we have the storms in the Gulf. And there's no better illustration of the risks and the, the hazard that the U.S. is subject to than the 20, 2005 hurricane season, where we had 28 named storms. We had so many named storms that we ran out of names in the English language and had to go to the Greek alphabet. And I call that the Greek bailout of our meteorological societies. So again, 15 hurricanes, uh, $120 billion just in New Orleans alone. And some of these main events here are ones that were all quite significant and worth writing about. There is a story about Hurricane Wilma and the extraordinarily um, effective response of Mexico to Cancun and their, 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 their the heartland of their tourist trade that's rarely told up here. It should be actually investigated and used as a case history of a good response. So we have communities and infrastructure which turn to government, in the case of New Orleans, to the Corps of Engineers, initially and historically for the first hundred years at least to protect against the river. And the way of protecting against the river was to canalize the sediments, uh, to loss of wetlands, to increase of storm surge, and, and thereby uh, a vicious circle. And regrettably, the control of the river and the control of the storm surge don't optimize in the same dimensional space for optimization. 
So this is very much a work in progress, but it's a work that we all need to be concerned about because it has a dramatic impact on it, and we don't know what the outcome is yet. As I mentioned before, it's an amalgam of social, environmental, and technological issues that are going to have to be resolved, and it has to be resolved in an integrated way because to do it in any other way just doesn't get the problem solved. So, if it wasn't for hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico, we now know that we have a hurricane threat in the northeast of the United States, right where the population centers are. A hurricane Irene was a warning call, and this I used in the original uh, distinguished lecture, only started eight months ago. We had 56 people killed in Hurricane Irene, 10 to 15 billion dollars of direct losses, almost seven and a half million homes and businesses without power. First time New York City evacuated portions of Manhattan and shut down its entire public transportation network, which is huge. It was record flooding, but it was a near miss. Then we had Hurricane Sandy, uh, 29th of October, coming on shore in the New York City area. Uh, as of um, uh, three weeks ago, 120 people, uh, 121 people killed, so more than 120. Uh, we've got about $60 billion now of combined property and uh, business losses, and that's a low estimate. Eight and a half million homes and businesses without power. Again, evacuation, and this time Wall Street, the heart of our financial world center, shut down for two days. Last time that happened was 1888, I believe, and that was during a major blizzard. Record flooding, and this time a direct hit. Now, why was this a different event? This is an animation of a hurricane, and I put a little image of Long Island and the eastern shore around the metropolitan area of New York just above that. And as this hurricane paralleled the coast, because they tend to do that, you can see that as they rotate in a counterclockwise direction, the outer bands are sweeping as a perpendicular direction of wind, piling up water to create a storm surge. So even hurricanes that parallel the coast are going to, by virtue of their counterclockwise spin, going to create a surge by virtue of the wind that's tangential to the rotation of that storm. But what Sandy did is it got sucked into a low and itself went perpendicular into the coast. So now you have amplified that wind, pushed up a heck of a lot more water, and then brought a big surge, as we'll show in this yellow arrow, right into New York Harbor, regrettably, with Staten Island being in the middle of the bullseye. Uh, New York was knowledgeable about hurricanes. You can see that um, they had evacuation zones established, zones A, B, and C, uh, for various categories of hurricane. This particular one got into zone B, about halfway through zone B. If you want to go to the website, and you can get a, a sense for how much of Manhattan was inundated. Uh, you can see that there's the New York City Tech Campus. Cornell has placed its new tech campus on Roosevelt Island, and uh, that was partially fretted, so we're doing uh, real-time experimentation down there. Uh, and this is the storm surge at the battery. I learned with, with Hurricane Irene that you have to uh, print screen to get this because it goes away. You can't get it again. Uh, and you can see you have a tidal variation of about 0.61 meters, and this was on top of a lunar tide. And as the hurricane came in, it came in coincidence with high tide. So you got 4.23 meters of water at its peak measured at the battery, which is right at the lower tip of Manhattan. If we subtract the tidal variation from that, we got about 3.62 meters of surge. So let me take that 4.23 meters because that's pretty representative of where the water went. Now let me show you a GIS analysis that we performed of what New York metropolitan area would look like with 4.23 meters of water on top of sea level. And here it is. 35% of the land mass is subsumed in water, submerged. Look at the rockways down there at the lower portion of that picture. You can see Kennedy Airport just inside of that, that sand dune area, the rockaways. A lot of people lived in the rockaways. Interestingly enough, not only did they get flooded, they got burned because of, of gas lines uh, probably being disengaged and catching on fire. We saw that with the Tohoku earthquake, enormous flooding and enormous fires at the same time. And uh, to give you a couple of ideas, there's LaGuardia Airport where I fly into New York that was underwater for three or four days. 
There's the battery where we were showing, so that's a pretty good central area for looking at the, the rise in the water level here. And let's go closer. Let's take a look at the lower elevations or the lower areas of Manhattan. If we again show where the inundation is, it looks something like this. You can see quite a bit of the periphery around lower Manhattan, which is underwater. There's the World Trade Center, totally submerged. There's the Brooklyn Bridge and again the battery. Uh, and then there's the New York Stock Exchange. There was some water backing up because of the, uh, of the drainage systems were not functioning that well at the time. Uh, and then there's that white dot. Uh, the World Trade Center and the white dot were actually uh, Verizon Central offices, which were the two feeds into the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, the white dot is still not recovered. It got totally inundated and hasn't uh, fully come back. And the World Trade Center came back within about 36 hours so the actual stock exchange could begin again two days later. Uh, if, if that feed hadn't been there, it's, it's not clear that they would have been able to open up Wall Street. And the interesting story about it is that they had moved their diesel generators. Not like the people at uh, Fukushima, they moved it to the 10th floor of the 140 West Street Central Office. But as we learn time and time again, because of building code, they must keep the fuel in the lowest part of the basement. There's five levels of basement in the Verizon building. And the fuel pumps are in the second level of basement. And so when those got inundated, the fuel pumps got knocked around and didn't work. And the fuel tanks got floated around and banged and disengaged. So even though the diesel generator was there, there wasn't any fuel to go into it. And so the way Verizon restored itself, it eventually got a fuel pump and fuel tanks on the, on the sidewalk and pumped up to the diesel engines, uh, diesel generators on the 10th floor and, and got the flow of data going to Wall Street. Here is a picture of lower Manhattan. I'm going to move it laterally onto the rapid transit system, New York City subway system. I'm now going to make this go transparent. And so you can see how many stations were underwater and how many tunnels were underwater at only the East River. Now, the East River, of course, is not a river. It's actually the sea. It just happens to be that body of water with curves around between Manhattan and Long Island. And uh, if we now put the rapid transit system uh, next to this, and you can see that flooded tunnels, seven subway tunnels in the East uh, River, a Brooklyn Battery Tunnel flooded, Midtown Tunnel flooded, the path of Port Authority and Trans Hudson Tubes um, tunnels uh, flooded, Holland Tunnel flooded. You had a major transportation issue. And of course, since a system is only as strong as its weakest links, if you take out those tunnels and the flooded, imagine the water coming in at South Ferry Station. And uh, the station is about 50, 60 feet below ground surface. And so for that water to come to equilibrium with, the, with five feet of water standing in South Ferry Station, you've got to flood out a lot of tunnel laterally before you pick up enough elevation to come to equilibrium here. And so you had this part of the system that was down and it's a big hole in the transportation system. A similar story is to be told for the, for the, uh, the Hudson River and the, the transportation arteries between New Jersey and New York. So you really had no commercial activity going on because people couldn't get to where they needed to go. They just couldn't get people back and forth. And then if we take a look at the electric power supply, as the water came up, it flooded the 14th Street uh, substation. It's a 138 kV substation operated by Con Edison. Uh, and it caused that big explosion that you may have seen this picture that's going around on YouTube of this, uh, this uh, transformer exploding. And then Con Edison, uh, now Con Edison designed virtually for the surge. So that surge number that I showed you before, the 3.6 whatever meters, they had this substation at that level, but they didn't account for the tide. And it was the tide that brought the water up into that transformer, caused it to explode, and then they shut down the entire electrical system from about 36th Street downward. That affects everything because without the power, Verizon had to go out and get, um, couldn't rely on backup power and couldn't get their diesels going. You couldn't dewater a tunnel unless you had electricity. And uh, all those tunnels depended upon uh, separate feeds on either side. The, the path tunnels had feeds from New Jersey Power and the, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the New Jersey side and from Con Edison on the, on the New York side. Uh, Con Edison also operates a, a number of steam uh, lines. So they have high pressure steam. Uh, 
It's uh, at about 400 degrees Fahrenheit and about uh, 140 to 180 degrees. You can't have a steam system be inundated with cold seawater because you develop condensation in the steam line and it'll cause it to explode. So they had to take portions of their steam system down. It looks something like that. So enormous, they couldn't get it reinstated because the, the, the rapidly until they got the electricity reinstated because in order to clean the traps of condensate, uh, you had to have electricity to pump the water out. Uh, this is a hurricane simulation done by Ning Lin, who's a professor at uh, Princeton University. And prior to Hurricane Sandy, in fact, uh, in a, an excellent paper in 2011, um, with Kerry Emanuel of MIT and a number of other authors, um, published uh, simulations of, of hurricane tracks uh, with very credible um, atmospheric and physics-based models. Uh, they used uh, some of the surge models that are used uh, routinely uh, by uh, modelers and people to predicting surge. They use SLOSH and, and ADS here. Uh, and they came up with these 7,550 7, storm tracks uh, that look like this uh, uh, distribution uh, function that you see here, this, this distribution of, of storm surge, uh, number of events, a histogram. And what I, I find interesting about this paper, uh, th this particular distribution is that if we look at it, you can see that the tail of this curve is not a mathematical function. It is points of, of extreme events. And we deal with the tails of probability distributions by smoothing some sort of a Pareto distribution or whatever to sort of make the mathematics work because we hunger for continuity and of course it's a one sum game anyway. So if you want to cover a tail, you got to take it from the center. I think that this is a very difficult thing to evaluate and that maybe that because of our successes with the centers of these distributions and we have had great successes and reliability and probability based design have been tremendous helps for us that we've developed perhaps a sense of comfort and a sense of extrapolation to the tails that may not be merited by our experiences. And so part of the new normal is re-examining the basis by which we allocate risk to the tails of probabilities. So the last part of this talk, the new normal. And the new normal is that it is anything but normal. If you really take stock of what I've just said, and if you really think about what's happened in a two-year period of time, and maybe less than a decade if you want to include Hurricane Katrina, if you don't get it that things have changed, then I don't know what it's going to take to kind of change your mind. So part of the new normal is actually a frame of mind or a frame of reference. Throw out the old one, create a new one. Think about things in a different way. Let's just talk about probabilities. Um, Henry Petrosky has published a new book called uh, To Forgive Design. And he goes over the space shuttle program. The space shuttle program, when it first started, was NASA told people it had a 1 in 10,000 chance of failure. 25 missions into Columbia, or excuse me, into, into um, um, uh, the Challenger, uh, they had a Tremendous failure. So that's a 1 in 25 chance. Then they flew 113 missions and they had the Columbia disaster. So that's 2 over 113. And then when the program, they, fl they flew the last flight at 134, that's 1 over 67, a far cry from 1 over 10,000. Same thing with nuclear. Uh, this target probability was the one that was quoted in the um, um, Economist, but really we're looking for a 1 to 10 to the minus 6 per year with respect to nuclear power. However, if we take the five major nuclear releases, the five, the three of Fukushima, the three Mile Island, and uh, Chernobyl, and we divide that by the 14,000 reactor years of performance, you get 10 to the, three times 10 to the minus 4, a far cry from 10 to the minus 6. So the tails control, but we don't quite understand them. And furthermore, if that wasn't enough in terms of the physics and the sort of climatological and seismological basis for these things, we have problems which are compounded by institutional constraints, by politics, sometimes by lack of perspective, and sometimes, as we see from the Hatamura report, by pure dysfunction. 
So bringing in the human element of this is, 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 is an additional aspect that is uh, difficult and hard to assess. So the new normal, if we can continue to borrow from El Alarian, is that there is infrastructure that is too big to fail. Certainly, the nuclear power system in Japan was too big to fail, and had they recognized that, they would have done something about it. If you had not depended upon probability or whatever your perception of probability was, but thought of what was possible, you may have been able to come to terms with that before it stole your future. So, too big to fail means we have to reassess risk related to critical infrastructure. And part of that reassessment needs that we need to reassess and identify what critical infrastructure is. If you go to the academic community and they write a proposal on infrastructure, it's all critical. But some infrastructure is more critical than others. And what I would say is that if you want to define what critical infrastructure is, let every community decide what's most important to it and define one infrastructure which is critical. You only get one. That's critical. That's really what's important. That's the lowest hanging fruit. We can't afford to fix all infrastructure against anything which is possible, but we can't afford not to fix some of it. And so the way it starts is that infrastructure has universal characteristics to it. The water supply of Los Angeles works on gravity and has the same principles and same appurtenances and so forth as the New York City water supply. But no one from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power would ever for a minute tell somebody from the New York City Department of Environmental Protection how to operate its water supply and vice versa. Because water supplies and infrastructures have a personality as well as a characteristic to them. They are institutionally framed by the communities and by the organizations which operate them. And therefore, even though infrastructure happens to be universal, infrastructure is local. And so the answer in part to this is local coalitions. You invented part of it here in, in the Bay Area. The bond issues which have allowed the retrofit of BART and the rehabilitation of the San Francisco water supply are extraordinarily good examples of improving infrastructure which isn't available to other parts of this country. So I believe that organizations like EERI and organizations like ASCE and others that are professionally worried about their future and have the technological or the sociological or the geological credentials to say something about it ought to say something about it. And they ought to pick what is the most critical infrastructure, and that is punctuated resilience. We can't solve everything at once, but we can solve some important things as soon as possible. And it probably won't be too soon. My nomination for America's Fukushima is the Southern California water supply. 70% of the water consumed in Southern California is imported. Through the, through the California aqueduct, the Los Angeles aqueducts one and two, and the Colorado River aqueduct. Theoretically, there's 30% left in groundwater, but part of that's contaminated, and the other part's really hard to get out of the ground under short notice. So there is a problem that if we have a 7.8 or an 8 magnitude earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, all of those sources of supply will undergo some rupture. So the California aqueduct system, and, and I may say that an excellent paper has been written by Craig Davis of LADWP on this particular issue. Uh, he shows, uh, using data which was generated from ShakeOut in 2008, that you can, for the east branch of the California aqueduct system, suffer between 13 and 17 disengagements of the, of the canal system that brings the water in from the northern part of California to the southern part. The Lake Elizabeth Tunnel will close shut if there is significant rupture on the San Andreas Fault, cutting off aqueducts one and two. And the Colorado River aqueduct goes over the southern part of the San Andreas Fault, which is a dog leg in the fault, which creates compression. And that event would be associated with up to four meters of rise. That changes the hydraulic grade for pumping the water over the, the San Gorgonio Pass. And, uh, and you have to get a pump station in there to operate it, and you're not going to create a pump station very fast after a major event. 
So this is where some of the water is coming from. Obviously, these are different organizations. They need to talk with each other. Uh, uh, if we were to lose that water, it could take six months to restore it. Six months to restore 22 million people, to restore the perhaps the most important economy in the United States, so it has a, a, a tremendous impact on all of us, and furthermore, probably the 11th or the 12th largest economy in the world. This, this is a potential disaster. Strangely enough, the fix isn't that expensive relative to the risk. There's the Los Angeles aqueducts. There's the Lake Elizabeth Tunnel. There's a picture of the Lake Elizabeth Tunnel under construction, about 2.9 meters wide. Shakeout was calling for 3.3 meters horizontal displacement on the fault. You don't have to have much imagination to figure out that you can't get that water supply back very fast if the fault ruptures. Uh, actually, what's being done right now is some of the ideas about high-density polyethylene are being utilized to reduce the risk. won't make it go away, but of course that fault could rupture one meter there. It could rupture two. And currently, plans are in place to put two 30-inch diameter high-density polyethylene pipelines through there. That, uh, that tunnel could close to about 2.7 meters. Those things would oval. They would remain intact and you could keep water going through them, and even though they're smaller in diameter, the water that runs through the Lake of the Tunnel now is by gravity. You could pump that, and you could make up for a lot of the lost flow. At least you keep something going. So it's a sort of a cost-effective way of reducing some risk early on, and that's being done as we talk. The last thing New Zealand should be doing is being further preoccupied in Christchurch. Let Christchurch recover. I wouldn't say the last thing, but, but the last thing rhetorically because there's a desperate need to export the lessons of Christchurch all the way north across the Cook Straits to Wellington, the capital which is built on the Wellington Fault. Wellington Fault movement here could decapitate the government. Um, it has all of the risks at Christchurch and a few more, and its lifelines are probably more at risk. They certainly have the same kinds of pipelines there, uh, but they also have a more significant fire hazard. So. Uh, some important things. Also, in New Zealand, the energy, the, the electricity is generated primarily in the South Island by hydroelectric, and it is fed to the North Island, to Auckland, across, across the Cook Straits, and all the, electro, the, the electric power and telecommunication cables go there. And an earthquake on the Wellington Fault or on the Wairapa Fault, which is slightly to the east, is going to cause massive submarine landslides because that's real steep terrain down there. They lose them occasionally from a submarine landslide anyway. So a very significant issue for them. There are a number of critical infrastructure projects we can be engaged with. Uh, and some of them are being worked on. The auxiliary water supply of, of San Francisco. And we have somebody in the audience here who's working on this, Ann Simmons. And uh, it's extraordinarily important. The, the big risk in San Francisco is fire following earthquake. And, and, and if you don't have that water supply working, I'm happy to say that there's a bond issue passed. There are major projects coming to, to bear that will improve this situation immensely and there will hopefully be another bond issue which carries this forward. And this is a sign of a resilient community that can actually come up with these kinds of projects and target things which are really important for infrastructure. So look, some broader issues I'm going to finish. Multidisciplinary dialogue is essential. We, we need to have engineers and social scientists and geoscientists and politicians and economists talk to each other. We say that a lot, but, but you know, talking the talk is a lot easier than walking the walk. Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples. There were a number of, uh, orga of, of conferences that were convened in the last year or so on um, important infrastructure items like the future of cities, 2011 in Chatham House. That's where all pre-cabinet um, policy is formulated. The Economist's Intelligent Infrastructure in New York City and the Rockefeller Foundation Century of the City, a wonderful volume, absolutely articulate, well worth reading. Anyone's interested in infrastructure and, and the future of cities, great. They had uh, about three weeks of conferences in their Bellagio Center in uh, Italy uh, to formulate this. But if we look at the number of just engineers looking, and we say we need a multidisciplinary, let's just look at these. These are planning type documents. We had no engineers of 28 speakers for the future of cities. Less than 10% engineers uh, engaged or invited to intelligent infrastructure and three out of 300 participants associated uh, with the century of the city formulation. So clearly we have a little bit of work here to create a better dialogue, and, and I lay that down perhaps to the engineers as much as I would to other people. We need to be a little more articulate and engaging, and we also need to invite to our technical gatherings some people that understand something from the planning end of things. We just need to talk more. We just need to get the thing done. We've got to pay for all of this. 
I'm not going to wax long and hard. Um, and, uh, Governor Christie, who, who clearly was at the forefront of trying to restore things and was a marvelous leader, was the person who terminated the largest infrastructure project in the United States, the Trans-Hudson Express. Uh, I mean, clearly there is concern about infrastructure, where the money is going to come from, because the old models are probably not going to work. We're not going to be able, we're so far behind the eight ball in infrastructure in this country that we won't even admit it, And first of all. And second of all, if we actually have to find the money to fund it, we're going to have to find a way to get private equity. We need the liquidity of markets outside of the public traditional works and bond issue markets. And that can't be done unless we get into public-private partnerships and we begin to experiment with something like infrastructure financing through an infrastructure bank. And finally, all of this has to reach out to the leadership. This is a particularly meaningful topic right now as we all hang on the fiscal cliff. This is a picture of Ray Nagan, who was the mayor of New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina struck, and Mitch Landrieu, who is the current mayor. And they both ran off against each other about six or seven months after Hurricane Katrina. And, and Mr. Nagan won that race. Uh, and, and he affected the outcome because he was focused on the sociological ramifications of restoration. Everybody got a chance to return to where they came from. But if you really look at where they're living, some of them haven't come back, by the way. The diaspora continues in the Lower Ninth Ward and elsewhere uh, to the point where it's even hard for energy to, to be able to justify putting in the utilities there because the return in terms of the people that are using those utilities aren't there, so that, that, that electricity is subsidized. But the question here is not, is social equity in a way where we can achieve some balance with nature? Uh, the, the, the committee that I sat on, which was part of the reconstruction of New Orleans and went on for four years, had 16 people of all different kinds of, 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 uh, of disciplines. We were unanimous in believing that New Orleans occupies a footprint that's not sustainable in, in terms of how... Uh, and even though it's got a much, much better hurricane protection system, which worked well under Hurricane Isaac and other recent hurricanes, if you got a, retreat, a, a repeat of, of Katrina, it would overwhelm the system simply because the surge would be higher than the seawalls. So we end up with this new nor normal for natural disasters. And this new normal is not so much a prescription as I mentioned before, a state of mind. It's, as a, as a professor I used to have, uh, Pro Professor Peck used to say, teach your brain to register what your eyes perceive. We have entered a new phase, I believe. And I really think that we need to think our risk we need to think our critical infrastructure and we need to work more towards a punctuated resilience where we can protect against what is possible beyond what is probable. Thank you very much.